Hello and welcome to Heal Yourself with me, Sarah Dawkins. I'm here to help you see that your body heals itself and share people who've already healed themselves along with health and wellness tips. And today, my guest is Vinetta, who started her healing journey back in 2013 after struggling with systemic lupus erythematous, serogen syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, and other associated conditions since 1988. With the support of a naturopath, Vinetta was able to review her diet and lifestyle and use natural remedies and treatments to support her healing. So welcome, Vinetta. It's lovely to see you. Hi, Sarah. It's lovely to see you too. Would you like to share your journey with the listeners so they can understand how lupus can be healed? Yes. Um, basically, yeah, sure. Um, how, where do I start? So, as you've said in the bio, I've I had a long, many decades of uh, just tolerating um, the condition and, and just taking medications like um, steroids and hydroxychloroquine and a whole array of other things that I was taking. But it just get, came to a tipping point where I just couldn't cope with the chronic fatigue and all the other things that came out of it. And I, I just kind of got a bit desperate, really. And so um, a friend of mine actually introduced me to... Um, an organization called York Test and they did a, a, a blood test and it showed up a lot of intolerances to food and um, she said now you need a naturopath <laughs> to help you to recreate your diet and um, so I basically um, tried to find a naturopath it was a bit tricky at first but I managed to find a lady who was actually happy to come to my home and sit with me and the reason why I liked her was because she was a Reiki master and that was the pull because I'd already started um, getting involved in Reiki which I'll talk about later um, but essentially she looked through my diet and she said it's not that awful really however I would suggest that you remove gluten and I thought oh no I can't handle having any more um, eliminations from my diet I'll, I'll have nothing left to eat but reluctantly I did it and after just two weeks I did start to see some huge differences the biggest thing for me was my throat it was really strange because um, one of the things about lupus it seems to affect the throat and and you have problems speaking sometimes um, it's like there's a blockage so anyway she, she I noticed that there was the phlegm had gone down significantly and that my voice was much clearer and with a lot more clarity and less runny noses and all those kind of other things that come out of um, you know having lots of, of, of mucus in the body and um, so then I was like oh I was quite switched on then because I was thinking something's happening here and um, she also at the time I, I have to admit I was very very depressed because it was just weighing down years and years of living the same way, not being able to do normal things like just go to a shopping centre because I just used to get so tired. Um, so I I just got really, really low. And um, she said, um, I'll prescribe for you. Uh, it was like a natural antidepressant it's i can't remember the name of its apologies but um if people want to find out i can i can dig it out um but essentially it's a it's a a product that's been discovered by a french um guy and it's from below in the seabed and um i had to take quite a high level of it for two weeks and it just seemed to get rid of the depression depressive feelings and um she gave me some other natural um supplements and remedies as well to take and all that in combination really started to move me into a much 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 better state of mind and i noticed that my brain fog uh, started to disappear 
um, I started to just feel a little bit more like my old self who hadn't forgotten all about me because this had been gone on, gone on for so many decades. And um, and then out of that, I just became more curious about looking after myself because I think healing yourself is about looking after yourself. And, um, and I don't think even now to this day, it's still something that I struggle with putting myself first if I'm really really honest but it made me start looking at um my you know am I having enough downtime just for me am I um doing my Reiki often enough am I um keeping away from toxic people um am I getting too involved in family dramas that can drain your energy all these so it started just looking at holistically and then I, I, I got involved in a group um, here in, in Hull, near where I live. Um, and um, I met a kinesiologist. I hope I'm saying that right. And she was amazing because she actually cleared a lot of my meridians out and got rid of a lot of childhood um, blockages and dramas and, and traumas and all sorts of things that I didn't even know were, were there. So I think it was just an overall, um, almost like an MOT, you know, really like looking here, there and everywhere to find out where the blockages is. So it wasn't just a food thing. It was more to do with what what am I thinking, how am I feeling, how negative am I, at, you know. So I started doing um, Louise Hay. I just... I, I discovered Louise Hay back in the 80s, but it just, I was like, whatever kind of thing. Didn't believe in it and thought, I'm not looking in the mirror <laughs> and saying affirmations. It just feels awkward and strange. Um, but anyway, I during this whole healing thing, I went for a spa day and they had a shop. And in the shop was the book, You Can Heal Your Life. So I was like, oh, it's that book again, which I'd already had before and I'd given it away. And I bought it again and I started rereading it. And I started, I literally spent um, almost like half a year listening to her uh, recordings over and over again. Um, I think that one of them was called 30 Days to Change Your Life or something like that. But literally, it, the principle was that you needed to do this, list, listening to this every day over and over again and get it into your head. And then that sort of tipped me into the whole Abraham Hicks and the law of attraction. So it just started like a snowball effect and a rabbit hole effect where I was finding all these different modalities and thoughts and and different way of thinking but my biggest um light bulb in all of it was when I discovered that my thoughts create things and um it scared me because I knew that I wasn't always thinking good things um I knew that I'd had been brought up in such a way that I was I had a scarcity mindset and, and a mindset of um, there's always lack and there's, it's always everybody else that gets stuff and I'm, I'm not going to get anything. And I realised that all these things were locked and trapped into my body, all of these, the, the way of thinking, just not having any self-belief or um, any positivity, you know. Um, I'd read positive thinking books before, but it's like when you finally decide to own it and to embody it, it's a whole different thing. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's just, it's so different. It's not, um, you, you, you sort of remove that cynicism about it and you start to think, well, maybe there could be something in this. And um, so I started trying to, change the way I think but I was terrified because of the way I thought <laughs> it sounds ironic but it scared me that when somebody holds up a list of these are your thoughts and this is what it means and this is how it affects you which is basically what Louise Hayes book says and does it 
was like, oh my God, Eureka moment. It makes perfect sense. You're just recreating more of what you don't want. So all of that was just leading me down this road of, of trying to change myself and change who I, I, I was and who I am. And I didn't, even to this day, I still haven't conquered it. It's, it's a daily struggle because every day um, you wake up and every day you deal with a different version of yourself. I think so. Um, Because you get triggered or the weather might be bad because we live in rainy England um, or the, or something happened, you know, somebody said something that you didn't like or you saw something um, in the media that made you feel down. And so every day you're having to reaffirm with yourself that, you know, don't attach yourself to those things. Don't, you know, you don't have to embody them. And you're having to turn it around. And I, I can't say that it's it's a complete, um, I'm a complete finished product. But what I can say is that through embracing some of these concepts, you can start to get on onto the path of, of healing. And, um, and sometimes you will, well, I found that I was trying, it's almost like I was starting to get a bit desperate. I was trying so many different things. Um, I became almost like um, obsessive with, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try yoga, I'm going to try um, sound healing, I'm going to try this, I'm going to, you know, you become like, um, yeah, obsessed. I can't think of any other way to put it. And um, it's almost like eventually, I think it's where I am now, you distill it down to what is absolutely essential for you, what's crucial for you and um, in so doing you're able to maintain and you could able to mess up as well and get back on the horse and keep riding because I think when you're trying to try and do all those different things because you see it on LinkedIn and social media like do this do that drink this much water eat this diet and and one of the things about going to the naturopath was just that was the confusion around food and how food was, um, so many foods were bad, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that. So it was lovely when she said, oh, your diet's actually not that bad, um, but let's make some tweaks. And, and she actually made me realise that there was nothing, no bad foods as such. Obviously, there's highly processed foods and things like that. But the foods that I was eating wasn't even in that realm. And so it was like almost like I was trying so hard to sort myself out that it, it it's almost like you can push too hard and to the point that you break it. And she made me realise I could just ease off a bit and just r- remove the gluten, stick to a relatively good diet 80% of the time and then 20% you might indulge in things that you you wouldn't normally have but that I was going to be okay and it it took a long time I think I started around 2013 working with her and she came and saw me a few times you know she came back to tweak and just to see how I was getting on but it was I think about four or five years in before I realized that I actually was healing. And how it came about was I actually went to see my rheumatologist and he um, was doing his usual testing and stuff like that. And for some reason that day I said to him, oh, how, how am I on a scale from one to 10? How am I? And he he was a bit reluctant. He didn't want to answer me, which was interesting. And um, he said, oh, I actually think you're in remission. And I said, why, you know, what makes you say that? He said, well, you've been on it for a prolonged time. And this, when I say prolonged, he meant a couple of years. So I didn't know this. So 
that's another part of being ill is if somebody keeps making you think that you're ill <laughs> and when you're actually not ill. So he said for about two years, I'd literally just been flat in all my readings. And I, that meant that I'd been well for a long time, but they didn't tell me. Yeah. And I was quite shocked. And then he said, um, and this is the best bit, I think, what have you been doing? And I just smiled and I didn't disclose. And the reason why I didn't disclose is because I knew that the health service wouldn't embrace what I'd been doing. They would have poo-pooed it. He would have made me feel silly, stupid, um, dangerous, because um, I've had that from my, my father-in-law actually said, oh, some of those herbal remedies are dangerous, you know, but they've got steroids in them. <laughs> and um, so I, I just smiled and I said, oh, just doing a bit of yoga and meditation. And I just left it like that. And my kinesiologist said, oh, you should have told him, you should have told him what you were doing. And I said, no, it would have killed it. I, so I didn't want to do that. I wanted to just leave him in suspense. But I was annoyed that he'd not told me that I was actually well. And um, and then I, I remember having the conversation about my medication and I said, um, can, can I come off my medication? And he said, oh, no, that's really dangerous. So, yeah, the danger word came again. And... Um, and I said to him, but well, I'm only taking, I can't remember the time, I think I was taking two or three a week, something like that. I'd completely reduced it down. And um, he he said, yeah, but, we, you know, if you stop taking it, it could all come back again. All, all your symptoms are going to come back again, and, and then we're going to go back to square one again. So he insisted I I stayed on, on the medication, in, even though I all my readings were saying there was nothing happening. And and then the other thing, and I forgot to say, Sarah, was he said, um, and I said, oh, so I'm, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm okay then, I'm cured, kind of, well, I'm in remission. And he said, yeah, well, sometimes, you know, with people, it burns itself out. So, and I was thinking, well, that completely juxtaposes itself with what you said when I first was diagnosed, how you'll have this for the rest of your life, there's no way out, you know, it was all doom and gloom, and suddenly it was like, oh yeah, sometimes some people just get well again, so it was all really, really weird and bizarre, and I just started to have very, very little faith in the that whole um, industrial complex of, of, he, of health, and I started to realise that I needed to just take control of the situation. And I thought, I want to come off this medication. Um, yes, the, the side effects are very low, but nevertheless, um, they're there. So one of the horrible side effects was um, that I couldn't go running or jogging or anything like that because it would create this horrible itching all over the body. Um, and if I had a shower and I came out of the shower I w and the room was a little bit cool, I would itch all over and just be red all over. And I'd have to literally get a hairdryer to try and warm my body up. Um, um, it was fine when I went to the gym because I could just jump into the sauna. And, and I thought, I can't. This is just crazy. I can't live normally. And, um, and the other side effect which I didn't have any problems with, but it's there, is that it can actually make you go blind um, because it can you have a, a, a build-up of toxicity behind the retina and over time you can, you can slowly go blind and it's irreversible. So even if you stop taking the medication, it's, it, the damage is already done. So that meant I ha every year I had to go and have a full screen of my eyes um, so it was like, I don't really want to be in this danger zone all the time. So it was actually during the whole COVID um, years 
um, when it all kicked off, hydroxychloroquine was being talked about a lot. And I remember um, it was Donald Trump that first brought it to the public um, space and, and said, oh, why don't we all take hydroxychloroquine? Um, it will help us with, with, with COVID. And obviously, everybody was saying, he's crazy. Um, it's going to make you have a heart attack. And I was like, hold on a minute. I've been taking this for 20, over 20 years, about, oh, I can't remember. It's almost close to 30, yeah, about 25 years. And, um, I've, and I've never, ever heard that as a side effect. And I actually went and checked again for myself, just for my own um, peace of mind. And I found there was the, the uh, side effect a heart attack was one of those statistics where they had no data. It was actually, it's on the um, summary of product characteristics. You have the side effects as well. Um, and it was just, it just wasn't there. So I was like, what's going on? But it made me start thinking, well, if they're going to span hydroxychloroquine, because it, it looked like they were going to say, nobody's allowed to touch this thing. I need to not be dependent on it because that's going to create a whole anxiety for me not being able to get my medication and I had that before um, there was a shortage of it historically and I remember getting really stressed about it because I couldn't get it I went to lots of different pharmacies you couldn't get it even though it's a generic and anyway I said right perfect this is the time to stop taking it so I seized the day <laughs> and I just stopped taking it. And um, so that was back in, 20, I think it was about 2021, 20, I think, if I remember correctly. I just stopped, literally just stopped taking it. And um, I've not had any problems and everything's stable. And the only... Um, time that I might feel a little bit funny is when I've been overexerting myself or um you know just doing all the wrong things like you would do normally you know normal people would just have the flu or they would have um cold sores or you know or just feel exhausted so you just think oh I'm overdoing it a bit and I might get a few twinges here and there um and also because lupus is very strange um disease in that it's almost like a barometer and so it changes with the climate with the temperature outside so when when you're going into winter you suddenly start feeling strange sensations in your joints and that'll last for about two or three weeks and then it settles and it's just telling you oh it's, it's winter and it does the same when you're coming into spring you get these yeah it's ever it's really really odd um and but i've just found all these things out through my own learning that the, the medical profession don't tell you these things you you they, they just don't tell you. you you find out through your own learning and you think okay it's normal it's winter okay it's normal it's spring don't there's no need to be scared there's no need to take a pill there's no need to take uh, anti-inflammatories you don't do anything you just go and you sit what I do I sit in a warm bath with salt Epsom salt or Himalayan salt or black sea salt any salt that I you know choose to have on that occasion and I just sit in it for 20 minutes and I get out and then all those sensations are gone they're completely gone from the body so it, it's it kind of reminds me of when I was growing up as a child and my mother used to be really into herbs and bought, she used to boil all these kind of weird things up in the saucepan. I thought, what is she doing? And then she'd say, drink this. And you think, oh, I'm not touching it. It smells disgusting. But it's weird. It's like I went kind of went back to that place where everything is already there and nature's been really kind to us it's given us everything we need 
to heal us ourselves. Um, and for some reason, we think that a, a little white pill is better. But actually, I think what the I've learned from the experience is that there's a lot of um, impatience because when you do heal naturally, it takes time. Like I said, it takes four or five years before I really felt really well. Um, but I think with the tablets, it feels like it's instant. So it's almost like an Instagram <laughs> of healing. <laughs> so you got it in an Insta. And I think that's the problem. We don't allow the process. And the process, up for me, gave me the opportunity to look inside of myself and to see my, like I said to you before, my thoughts, to look at my lifestyle, what, you know, what, what kind of people I was hanging around with, um, look even at my job, because I actually, in all, in what I didn't mention, in all of that, I actually left my job, because I actually realised that that was contributing to um, how I was feeling. It was a very, very stressful work environment and um, very demanding and very challenging. And I was trying so hard to, to keep up. And even though I had all these health problems and I actually ended up going off sick for three months and that had never happened to me before in my life. And so I felt a complete failure <laughs> because of that. But it, my doctor said, you can't, you can't go to work. It's just impossible. And it was just like, I just thought, I need to leave. I have to do this for me, for myself. And um, I think to anybody who's listening today, I would say, don't, don't just look at food or how much water you're drinking or whether you're drinking filtered water or, um, you know, bottle of water or whether you're taking the right herbs. It's, it's much more than that. It's, it's a whole top and tail approach. You have to go through the darkest tunnels of your life and look at it. Um, there's one, uh, Reiki ma master says she said it's okay to look and I love that um, just go there and have a look at it and see what what it could be it's uncomfortable it's painful it's not pretty <laughs> and yeah you will cry really ugly tears and you will be um, sad and down but you're releasing so much stuff because it's like an onion isn't it you're peeling back all the layers and every time you think, oh, I'm all right now, and then something else comes up. And it, so it, it's the healing isn't just the, you know, it's not just a one-stop shop. I'm going to go and get a naturopath and I'm going to, you know, have a little bit of Reiki and then I'm, I'm sound. It's not like that. It's, 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 a, it's forever. It's for the rest of your life because we're carrying so much trauma. We're carrying... I know that in myself, I'm definitely carrying trauma from generational trauma. I know that. And um, so you're having to deal with all that. And you, you can't just think that, click your fingers and it's sorted. You have to, um, you have to sort of almost like, it's like steps. You go up, up step by step. So like wh where I am now in 2024, I've come, come to another funny, weird place where I'm doing another process of healing. I mean, even just talking to you today, for me, that is massive because it's like I'm okay to talk about it because I've been ashamed about it for such a long time. Like, it's my, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting a bit upset. It's my fault that this has happened and, and I'm really ashamed about it, you know? Um, it's in, in my culture as well, which is something that's important to, to say. Um, um, my parents were they're both deceased, they're, they're, they're originally from Jamaica and they came to the UK in the 60s. 
we don't talk about illness ever. Um, and illness is seen as like something has happened to you that is come from a sorceress space. That's how I'm going to put it. It's you almost like you've been bewitched or something's happened. And it, I understand it. Academically, I get it. I've studied it. I know I did anthropology at Manchester. And I get it. It's all to do with how you rationalise what's happening to you. And that's how it's done in, in, my, in my cultural experience. That's how it was done. It was like something's hap something bad has happened to you. Um, and so it's very difficult to be ill. Yeah, and and even in in most cultures now as well, we we're so wanting to do 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 all the time to prove ourselves often that being ill almost seems like um, a weakness, a flaw within us. Um, and it, it's about understanding that we're all just human, and we do get ill at times and quite often those times of illness are really our body saying i need to rest i'm going to have all these symptoms because i need to rest and it's not a sign of weakness it's a sign of strength if we can recognize that and listen to our body and take that rest that takes real strength and confidence to say i can't come into work I, I am not feeling 100%. I need to rest. And, and not everybody can say that. No, uh, and, and I think because um, the way I've been brought up, my mother was a really incredibly strong woman. She was like a force to be reckoned with. She, you know, she raised 10 children. So you can imagine what she was like. And weakness is not, it doesn't come into play ever. You, you battle through. And um, and because I was quite an ill, I was quite ill a lot when I was a child. So I think it was always there. I think I was the outlier, you know, the one that was more, I was an empath and I didn't know it because I didn't understand any of these concepts before. And it was, I was an absolute burden for them. You know, it's like, oh, this is the one that's always ill. You know, that's how I was referred to. So, yeah, I was always embarrassed about being ill in the hiding it away so even when I went for a job I'd never mentioned that I had a chronic fatigue no. I would just go to work and drink loads of coffee or just find a way to deal with it and I think that was making me even more ill <laughs> because yeah. I'm trying to live up to that expectation again and um and just even like within because I'm externally I'm very strong I am I don't come across as a weak person, but internally I'm very fragile, I, and I know that, and that's okay. It's it's okay, but because of that, nobody expects me to ever break. You see, and um, last year my 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 brother died, and everybody's like, um, it was really really difficult. And I, I remember at the funeral, I, I broke because I really loved him and I miss him and all that. And everybody's like, what's the matter with you? Come on, stiff upper lip, you know. And I was like, I couldn't believe it that they were not allowing me to have the full spectrum of emotions. Yeah. It was like, no, you've got to stay strong. It's almost like if I don't stay strong, everybody collapses underneath me. So... I feel under a lot of pressure sometimes, and I'm sure that that has contributed to being ill. So I think it's almost like a superwoman trait. And, and, and the more people expect it, the more we feel the need to live up to that. Absolutely. So this, this year, I, I really recognised it after my brother passed away. I really did recognise that. I'm too strong sometimes and I need to break and I need to be weak and I need to do it without getting ill. I'm it, I, I'm sorry, I don't even think it's about being strong or weak. I think it's about giving yourself permission to feel what you're feeling mm -hmm. and express it. 
and hoping that others will take on board that your expression of your emotions is as valid as anybody else's. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And 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 it's funny because I've I've like joined a, a coaching um, group this year because I just that felt like after my brother died, it, it really it's it's not I've kind of it's knocked me mentally in in more ways than I expected, and I thought I need a little bit of support. I think I, I can't. I can't just keep performing, you know, because it is a performance, isn't it? Yes. And um, so I've, I've been using that, but w one of the amazing things to come out of it is how many, it's just a women's only group, how many other women are doing exactly the same thing and how many of us are ill from it. And um, and and it's really been, how it's, it's been phenomenal, very painful because I've had to go into some more dark corners again <laughs> and unravel some more stuff that I didn't know was piling up in the in the in the corner more laundry to do and um but it's been like that permission that I grant you it's okay you can be weak you can be strong you can be uh you can be all those things you don't have to perform you can let yeah. it all go and just be, be who you are. Simple. Yeah, be yourself. And I think I'm sure I'm starting to realize that that's where my illness is coming from. Okay, they label it lupus and all that. That's just a label. But actually, I think underneath it all, it's it's that disconnection from my myself and from source and all those other things that's having an impact yeah on me because I've, I've i believe that i came into this existence and i was going to be a certain way i was going to be this thing that i had all my plans and then you're born into a, a certain family and then you're born into a certain dynamic and then that freedom that you had gets kind of um overshadowed and you find yourself performing, living up to, acting out other roles that are painful, that are not really who you are. And you, um, you and then you get ill. Yeah. It's, and, it's, and it's people it's, pleasing. It's people pleasing. It's, it's burning yourself out. It's not thinking you're worthy. It's also that's, if this is the only way to survive it is to, to, to live up to people, please. But it's learning that now I can please myself. And I think even with the healing thing, one embarrassing thing, but I will say it because I want to be authentic and honest, is it's almost like you don't want to get well. Because, and it was my Reiki master who talked about that. And I it felt like she'd punched me in the gut when she said it. She's she goes, are you getting something out of it? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And and but I went home and I went, okay, I'm going to have to sit on that one. I didn't like it, but she made me think. And it's it's not a conscious thing, but in your subconscious, you get something out of that kind of being a victim, being sad, being poorly, not being well. Because um, then suddenly you get that attention that you. That's how I felt. Um, I got the attention I needed, and it's almost like it was the only way yeah. to get love. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Illness serves us. Yeah. So there's always a, a, a hidden benefit in in sort of you know the the diseases, if you like, um, and they're serving a part of us that we need to make conscious and become aware of, so that we can heal. Yeah, and and she she um she was she she was an amazing lady. Sadly, she passed away um about three years ago now. But she did. She said to me, um, you, you know, are you getting something out of it? And I was so annoyed. <laughs> yeah, because you you, you it, it puts the spotlight on us becoming that victim, 
Um, and once we can acknowledge, yes, it's serving me because it's getting me the love that I'm, I'm craving for, or it's building me a support system of, of people who I now call friends that I might not have otherwise had, when we can see that for what it is and know that we can heal that and step outside of that, and we can have maybe a different circle of friends supporting us for who we are truly and authentically outside of that sick role. Mm. But it is it is a process to work through that because I've been there and sat in that victim mental hood of mindset. Yeah. And, um, and, and it served me because it, it kept me small, but it, it brought people to me. Yeah. Um, it's kind and it's of, about stepping outside. Yeah, it's kind of a weird kind of twisted safety net. Yes. If that makes sense. Yes. It's almost like you feel like, well, I can just, you know, roll myself up into a little ball and be sick. And yeah. uh, and then nobody's going to really bother me here. And uh, and so I think it's, if you really genuinely want to heal, I would say, you'd be, you, you've got to really be prepared to look at stuff like that and yeah. the things that in yourself that you might, you might think, no, I'd never do that. I would never make myself into a victim on purpose. Oh, I wouldn't be a martyr, you know, because there's a martyrdom in there as well. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I'm not like that. But if you're willing to say, okay, there's a possibility that in my, at least in my subconscious, because yeah. Yeah. I do think it's the child in you that's doing it it's she's she needs to be served and her, the way she fa feels that she's served because I was a very sickly child so it's like well what happened when you were sick well everybody gathered around me yeah. and so there you go thank you Vanessa that's and that's a, a beautiful piece of advice as well is to to go inside and look at, at why the sickness is presenting Thank you. And where can people find you? Well, you can find me on mainly on LinkedIn, really. Um, I do do have a, a presence on Facebook as well, so you can find me there. But I'm not very active on that. Um, so LinkedIn would probably be, be the best place for me. Lovely. And thank you for joining us and sharing your healing. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to speak about it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for listening. Please share this podcast with anyone who you think will benefit. And can you leave me a review wherever you've listened to it to help me reach more people? Thank you.